Hey everybody, how's it going? So, gonna do something new here on the show. I haven't done this before. You guys have seen me do some one-on-one interviews, but this is first my, my first chance to get to do a roundtable interview with a couple of actual audio professionals. You know, the thing you guys accuse me of never being, oh, who's he? I've never recorded. I've never heard of any of the bands he's worked with. Yes. Just like you and everybody else who watches this show, at least 99% of you. Anyway, we got a couple of hardworking engineers here uh, from Hawaii and AIX DSP. He's the man behind the software and one of the creators of Reaper, actually. It's Aaron right. Carey. Uh, how's it going, Aaron? Hey. Uh, also a professional much, Mac hater. <laughs> yeah, so pretty much everybody just calls me Pipeline Audio or Pipe or whatever, so I don't think anybody actually knows my name, so it's, it's Oh, wow. Uh, okay, okay so Aaron Carey <laughs> from Pipeline Audio, also yeah. one of the guys responsible for Reaper. We're going to ask you a question about that. And we've yeah. also got Ethan Weiner, the creator of Real Traps. Uh, you guys have probably seen ads for that in all kinds of pro audio publications over the last couple decades and whatnot. Real Traps are pretty much legendary, and uh, they do a wonderful job because they're not made of, of foam. They actually you know, do what they're supposed to do because they're based on science. Anyway, welcome to the show, guys. So nice to have you guys on board. Um, we're going to talk about a number of things and hopefully not bore anyone to death. This is like This is basically a podcast with video. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Okay, not everybody wants. Wow, what a crowd. Okay. What a bunch of ad livers. So, <laughs> oh, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, guys. Uh, no, seriously, thrilled to have you guys on board. Ethan, like I said, I've been a fan of you for quite some time now. Ethan uh, started the Real Traps. When did, the, when did those come out? Like early 2000s or so? Yeah, I think we started the company, my partner, Doug, former partner, uh, in 2003, 2002. We had the idea and started putting it together. And I think our first ads in like Mix Magazine and Electronic Musician was uh, 2003. Okay, right. Because I remember seeing those ads come out and thinking, whoa, whoa, what's this all about? You know, because it's like, these aren't made out of foam. This looks a little bit different. And you guys were using like, what, the Corning 703 uh, compressed well, fiberglass, right? Yeah. And, and to be clear, since you didn't say it, what we do is acoustic treatment, mm. uh, you know, bass traps and reflection absorbers and, and diffusers and, and that kind of stuff to make rooms sound better. It's not sound isolation right you know you, right. My, you know my neighbors are complaining but it's making the room sound good making it accurate flat so you can mix or master with confidence right exactly That's and the there point. is a difference between you know soundproofing and acoustic treatment and it's like i i just got hit up by this company from china they're like oh hey check out our soundproofing panels and i'm like guys i can't put this on the show these are not soundproofing panels these right. are this is for acoustic treatment there is a difference and it's like you guys are selling this stuff you should know the distinction right, right. not mentioning yeah, any and, names yet <laughs> and 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 just to what you were saying before yeah we use genuine owens corning 703 and 705 uh, we don't use mineral wool or rock wool or foam or uh, 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 shredded blue jeans, which actually is a popular product. And they work, but they sag over time. Uh, the rock wool turns to dust. If you, you know, hang a panel, you take it off and you move and you carry it again, it's, you know, it's, it's dusty. You put them on the ceiling and they sag, you know, when they're flat, you know, parallel to the to the ceiling. Okay, so yeah. Oh, I, got ton, stuff. I got tons of rock wool in here. Good thing I don't move it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, it, it works, but you know, but the Owens Corning stuff costs a lot more, but it's better. It's a more professional product. Okay, fair enough. Good to know. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. You want the rigid stuff because it's denser too, as well. But Aaron, what uh, right. what can you tell us about your background, especially with Reaper? What what was your involvement with that? Uh, I think the way this really kind of went down, there was a, a lot of us were Sony Vegas users, or actually there was Son Sonic Foundry before that. Okay, and um, kind of their beta team on the audio side started to feel pretty left out by by Vegas 2. We started a forum called Crossfade with a bunch of ex Cakewalk users and and some other DAWs and uh man I ended up with this like 125 page hand drawn nonsense thing that I was carrying around and hitting all the developers with I, I uh the guy who ended up making uh what do you call it Ardor um yep Ardor he, for uh yeah, yeah, the, we, the open source one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we ha hammered him like crazy, and I just found out that he was one of the original founders of Amazon. He never said anything about that back in the day. Wow, I think he was one of the first three or whatever. And um, we we were hammering him and a bunch of other developers, and and nobody really kind of got what it was. You know, he he was not an engineer, and and it seemed to me that most software was made by people that had never been within twenty miles of a recording studio. And uh, we really wanted routing. I wanted a soldering iron, a screwdriver, 
and a, and a and a handful of connectors in software. So I always watch Ethan fighting with people on like the womb and other forums like that. And um, God, recorder man's the womb. Oh man. Oh, oh that's yeah. And, or no, that was mixer man's place. Wasn't it? Yeah. Mix, mixer right. man. And all, but I mean, everybody was there and um, yeah. Kenny Joya of all people, because this is how ironic this is, was making fun of this guy. He said, look at this kid. He's making this silly ninja app so that, Idiots can play with each other on the net, you know, and he's making fun of it. And so I go take a look and I'm like, you know, this is the basics for what could be a DOS. So I started hitting up this developer. You know, I, I spent the last $10 I had to send him an RME sound card uh, in the mail so that he could test with that. And um, you know, he told me, oh, you don't need to do that. And then I find out like a couple weeks later, he's like, hey, check it out. I'm on Rolling Stone. And he's on the, I think he's on the cover of Rolling Stone as the world's most dangerous geek. And he had like, Forty million dollars or four hundred million dollars or whatever from selling his uh, Nullsoft to AOL, Time Warner. Wow. And I'm thinking, I just spent the last ten dollars of my life to send this crap to you, man, and you're made a dough. And um, but but he, you know, we we worked back and forth on it. Me, him, and uh, Christoph Diebald, and uh, he, we ended up he ended up making Reaper. And then, you know, years later, Kenny Joy is like the man that tells you how to use Reaper. I know. That's the thing. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, I hit up Kenny's tutorials all the time. If I'm kind of scratching my head about one function yeah. or another, and I'm like, yeah, let's see. What, I guarantee Kenny's got a video on it. You know, his, think, his channel is a wonderful resource for, for finding yeah. out really cool, you know, hidden gem features about Reaper because I've been using it for years and I'm still figuring stuff out. So, Yeah, I think that's his penance. <laughs> well he does a fantastic job oh at yeah it. he's That's like a reaper guy he... check out kenny's channel it's very informative yeah so so that's cool. Anyway, um, so thanks for a little background on that. I didn't know you spent your last that. That's real. Yeah, you know, that just about figures. Spent till <laughs> I think I remember seeing that cover actually. <laughs> the the oh, yeah, yeah. don't think. Wow, small world. That that's hilarious how that goes. Yes. My big question is if Kenny's paying a penance for making fun of the kid who came up with Reaper. When's he going to make his penance for unleashing Marcy's playground upon the world? Oh <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. Yeah, I, I tried listening to it, but I keep falling asleep during it. See, Ethan's old enough that that doesn't affect him. He's like, what the hell is that kind of crap? I, don't, I never heard any of that. <laughs> Lucky anyway. him. Okay, so um, what, what's the agenda today? Well, what you, you said you had a couple things you wanted to discuss. Let, let's let's jump into it. Let's see what we got here. Um, I did. I'm not sure how far you guys want to take this, but uh, have, have you? did you guys see this Tom Schultz thing? No, I have um, no idea what you're talking about. Uh, okay, he... he he uh, he started talking about how digital was awful compared to analog, and uh, he 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 really missed a lot of the fundamentals of digital audio when he did it. I was going to uh, say, didn't the, didn't this get debated ad nauseum on gear sluts in the early two thousands? Yeah, and yeah. Like, Ar- the general around- consensus was, unless you're uh, uh, from my, you know, just before we jump into this, um, yeah. the Tom Schultz thing. I was going to make a point here. Unless you're talking about absolute top of the heap analog, where everything is maintained every single day, and you've got pristine channel strips and everything's working exactly perfect digital is going to beat the living shit out of analog every single time pretty much yeah. uh but it looked like you doubled down but uh, yeah if, if you guys if you guys haven't been following this one I, I, I wouldn't worry about it but uh closely related to this is you know people constantly say that you know if you have the top of the line digital gear or if you have really good ears you can definitely hear the difference between you know, this digital and that digital and 96 K and this and that. And I'm like, you know, I always ask people, do you have any evidence for this? Because every time we ABX this, they can't tell, but it's, it's, people are so happy to make bald assertions with no evidence. And you know, my thing is if, if, if you're going to make an assertion without evidence, I can dismiss it without evidence, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's an extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And yeah, yeah. that claim, I mean, that's just classic Christopher Hitchens uh, reasoning right there. Oh yeah. Claims made without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, you know what the core problem is, is people don't realize how difficult it is to do a proper listening comparison. First of all, of course it has to be blind yeah. and I don't know if it has to be double blind, but it certainly has to be single blind. And, mm-hmm. uh, but it's so complicated, uh, and so uh, it's just so difficult to do properly. I wrote a, a very detailed article for uh, for Live Sound International magazine. It's also up now on Pro Sound Web. And there were so many details of what you know, so many requirements and criteria to do it correctly, so that you get you know the right answer. Uh, that it, they had to sp- split the article over two issues. It was so much stuff to write and and to say. And it's uh, and that's really the problem. People 
you, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, let's compare microphones. So they'll put a microphone in front of a, a guitar or a singer and then record it. And then they'll get another microphone, put that in front of the singer or guitar and record again. Well, different performances are completely different. If the mic moves even an inch from where it was, then it's going to pick up a very different response. Uh, and, yep. and there's proof of all this stuff all over my website and in my audio expert book, all kinds of you know, evidence and showing how this happens. Yeah, well, uh, I totally get where you're coming from. And this this has helped debunk a lot of bullshit um, in my sphere anyway. This is a re- this is the Signal Art reamp box. This is a phenomenal reamp box. Super clean. Um, had Chad Kelly uh, design this for me. Um, this is this is several revisions in because the first one he sent me, I'm like, nope, not hot enough. It needs to be louder because <laughs> it's losing signal. And he actually took a year revising this before he got this. And uh-huh. now he's, he's got this. This thing's amazing. Anyway, point being is I've used this to test tubes. I've used it to test, you know, uh, I just did my cabinet shootout and we did a blind test. And uh, that was out like last Thursday. Yeah. And here, I'm like, here, here's three different cabinets in a mix. Pick them out. No, no <laughs> visual cues, no nothing. You tell me where this. Nobody could tell what cabinets where. And we right. did the thing. We reamped the same performance and measured exactly to where the microphone went. Everything's taped off on the floor. You know, I got everything down to, you know, about one thirty second of an inch, you know, in all dimensions wow. and got the mic back exactly the same spot. And nobody could tell the difference. I know I can tell you the one thing, though, is because uh, this is the, the big question is, is tone what a thing? You know, of course, it's bullshit. But is tone what a thing for guitar cabs? Is changing the material going to be different? And um, I'm not going to reveal what's what, but we t- tested out particle board versus MDF versus plywood. And I'll tell you this. If you do find tone wood in a guitar cab, you don't want it. <laughs> well, you know, but but here's what's important. Anything that sounds different, that really does sound different and can be identified as different in the blind test, can be measured. You can right. measure the response. You can measure the ringing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with, with the free, you know, Room EQ Wizard software. Room when EQ tested, Wizard software? What's this all yeah, about? Yeah, you better get REW, man, or you're fired. Oh, that's a very, very popular program. It's donationware, so if you like it and use it professionally, uh, like I do, you know, you give the guy some money, All right. uh, but you can download a full, uh, fully functional version for free. And it's fantastic. It shows distortion, uh, of, of loudspeakers, not just total distortion, but isolates his third, fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth harmonics. I mean, it's, it's amazing software as a room simulator where you can move a virtual a microphone or listening position around in the room and move the subwoofer and change the height of your, of, of, sub, you know, 7.1 speaker. I mean, it's, Oh. And, and see what the response is. It's uh, it's amazing. When I tested speaker isolation, and you've seen, it started with the Oralex Mopads, mm-hmm. and now there's like uh, you know a dozen companies selling it with full page ads. They're making money selling these speaker isolation, and I knew it just was bullshit. And I tested it, and it, and I had to do like you were talking about measuring to the thirty second of an inch. Uh, you have to make sure that the speaker is in exactly the same place. If you put a measure a speaker and the microphone stays, but now the speaker is three inches higher. It's a very different response reaches the microphone, not because of the, of the isolation pad, but because the speaker is three inches higher. Right. And when you account, when you account for that, all of those differences go away. Mm. I call these things placebo based products (laughs) because that's how they work. Right. No, that, that, that's absolutely true. And um, just going back on this, um, sorry, we got to hit you up on the RumiQ software. It's like, I always see, you know, these frequency response graphs and whatnot. Will that give me exactly what I want, like a snapshot instead of like a real time? Uh, yeah, you can you can put out a 3D waterfall from that too, right? Or is okay. that a I don't need a 3D software? waterfall. Yes. I, just, I need to keep it basic so everybody can understand. We are, you know, making this show for bass players and drummers. You know, so. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not complicated. It oh, just shows it's, what yeah. happens over time. Okay. Well, I just so put it in my see? favorites, so I'm going to definitely check that out. Thank you so much for that, guys. Appreciate that. Uh, it's like, well, it's, all this is going to do is help me make a better show as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. A couple of years ago, I, I put out a series of articles on my website where I measured all sorts of mic preamps and, and uh, converters and audio interfaces and stuff. And mostly what I used was REW, it, it, or Rumi okay. Q Wizard. It, it actually is good for testing a lot of stuff. And, mm-hmm. and um, we did a lot of apples to apples tests, and it was surprising just how close like every interface out there, no matter how much money you're going to spend on the thing. In fact, when we did the DI box tests, the more money you spent, the worse they got once you got to a certain level. Come on. And, um, yeah, it, it got pretty crazy. The, but the, uh, the, all the Jensen-based stuff was fine, even though it had a transformer and stuff. Um, 
Yeah, the radial stuff was great, mm-hmm. um, but as you went, not up a fan from of the there, radial reamp, the the X amp that uh, that colors the tone in a, in a in a way that's not fun. Oh yeah, I didn't even try that thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, like I said, signal art. Yeah, Chad spent a lot of time on this one. This one's the cleanest reamp box I've ever done. I need to do that. I need to do a reamp box shootout, and it's like, oh, okay, now I know how I'm going to do it. That's yeah. cool. You guys just gave me a great idea. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a great piece of software. There, there was a couple other pieces, but I, I noticed that the better tests you do in general, the, the more uh, it pisses the, people off. Well, yeah, you know, that that too. But the differences <laughs> the differences get a lot smaller to non-existent. If people actually test their digital claims against mm-hmm. each other, um, and they do it properly, there there is no usually there's not a difference like when we were first in the reaper alpha there was a lot of still people talking about daw summing and all this stuff uh, and yep. we had we had identical files that um that nulled not just nulled but they were actually the same bit for bit identical files and people still insisted that they heard a difference and that was crazy <laughs> so they could never pick it out in an abx test but once they knew what it was they said yeah this one's much better and yep. oh uh, yeah it, it was I've, crazy. I've seen that happen numerous times on the show. I've done, you know, I'll usually do my tests. I'll do them in two parts. Here, here's the blind test. Then here's what you're actually listening to. It's like, oh yeah, I knew that. I knew that. Yeah, bullshit. You did. Yeah. And, and you know, I always say that if it manifests in the real world, whether or not we know how to test it, if it manifests in the real world, you can you can measure it. And mm-hmm. it, it's this whole God of the gaps thing where they, they're constantly, you know, I, I run into this a lot more with medical myths and stuff, but th- there's always a, a something there that, that you're not measuring. There's a, there's a something in there that you don't know about. And I'm like, you know, if the file's null, I'm sorry, but there's not something in there that, that we, we may not know about it, but it's not making any difference at all, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Well, and, 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 you know, let me just address a little of that. You can, there, you can measure the difference between, you know, if you're, th- you're talking about measuring converters and whether they sound the same and measure the same. One converter... It might have 0.001% distortion, and another might be 0.002. Well, both of those are too soft to hear until you get to at least 01, which is like minus 80 dB down, you know, 80 dB down. Uh, you're, you're not going to hear it anyway, so we can measure to much better than what can be heard. And uh, oh yeah, uh, that, and that's, that's an important factor. Yeah. Well, and well, still that's, one, one of the all-time greatest tests ever on gear sluts was the converter shooter. You guys know which one I'm talking about there. It was about, happened about 2005, 2006, where they shot out all these super expensive converters against <laughs> the uh, Behringer ADA 8000 <laughs> and the Behringer oh, 1. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did, the, I did the same also on gear sluts with, uh, with three levels of cards from a Sound Blaster, a $25 Sound Blaster card up to oh, a uh, Lavery uh, purple or gold or whatever, I forget what color it was. Okay. But uh, livery blue and uh, and a five hundred dollar card in between, and uh, that's still on my website. And it, it's 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 a blind test because the files are there and people email me mm-hmm. what which one they think is a sound blaster, and I think more people pick the sound blaster sounding best than than the livery. And the reason is they actually went through two passes to create the sound blaster card. I actually played it out and recorded it again. I didn't. I couldn't record all three things at once, so there was an extra two generations and output and back in again. Mm. So it was ever so slightly grittier, yeah. and people heard that. That's why people like analog tape and vinyl because it's a little gritty. It's got that you know that tape effect. It's got that uh, subtle distortion that they like. Okay, here here's a question. Yeah, now that we've got great, since we're talking about conversion and all this kind of stuff. Now, one of the big things about um, working with outboard. Uh, cause I've got a ton of outboard stuff here. Some people will bitch, oh, well, you know, when you, when you have a signal in digital, then you got to put it back in analog and then back into digital again, you know, you're losing, there's, there's quote unquote generation loss. Um, in my experience, it really hasn't hurt anything. You know, if I got, if I got to send a signal out to a couple, couple of analog compressors and then back in, um, I'm not losing anything in terms of fidelity, at least in my practical experience. What, what do you guys think about a lot of that? Well, that's because the distortion is so low. The frequency response is so flat. There's so little noise uh, in modern converters, even cheap converters. I, I drive people in the hi-fi forums crazy. I have a thirty-dollar SanDisk uh, clip jam. It's called Media Player. It costs thirty bucks. And you know, in hi- the hi-fi world, they talk about DACs. You know, the, the, <laughs> yep. it's not the incoming conversion, but the playback conversion, digital to analog. And you know, and they're saying, oh, you got to spend at least a grand to get a good DAC. You know, it's clearer, it's better. And so when I bought this $30 player, I measured it. I recorded uh, test files at 24 bits to get the lowest noise and distortion, or actually created them with software in SoundForge, put them into this thing, played it out and recorded, and 
analyzed the distortion, and it was like way, 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 way down. You know, it was like much more than 80, 90 dB down. You know, it was oh, 110, something like that. And so that's all you need. Yeah. You know, all, yeah. you, you don't need to spend thousands of dollars on this stuff. So that's why you can go out and in again. That's another test that's on my website is multiple passes, uh, uh, 10 passes with, uh, with, with a couple different sound cards. Okay. And you can hear after, I, actually one of them is 20, there's a couple different ones. One of them is 20 passes with a sound blaster card. And yeah, after 20 passes, you can hear some degradation. But it's nothing, you know, two, one or two is not a problem. And with the good converters... Now, just as a frame of reference, what was the noise floor, say, on analog tape? Say, like, two-inch two inch analog. Without oh, noise reduction? It's, uh, if it's really good, it's like 65 <laughs> okay. Uh, dB. Okay, so you're, it's hissy. You're talking, you're talking the hiss on tape would be about 65 dBs down, and you're talking even the cheapest playback system, 90 dBs down. Okay, yeah, yeah I, th I think that kind of speaks for itself right there. Well, yeah, 16 bits is 96 dB. Uh, the, uh, the analog tape is the equal of 11 to 13 bits okay. of digital. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, okay, learn something that's new that's every day. Answer. This is great. <laughs> but, I want this and, guy back course, on the show, Dan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He well, knows and everything. Of course, digital does not have head bump. Okay. Uh, it <laughs> doesn't, doesn't have, you know, all the problems, and it doesn't get more and more distorted as you approach zero mm. and go a little above zero. It's absolutely clean right until, you know, the hard, hard clipping at zero dB, you know, right. full scale. So I have a section in my audio expert book called The Failings of Analog Tape. It's like three and a half pages of all the things, you know, <laughs> It's amazing that it works at all, and it's because these chemical and electronic engineers worked for decades to make really good circuits and really good high quality slurry that you know becomes the the magnetic material that goes on the tape. Sure, and that's why it's as good as it is. Uh, well, yeah, and, and I mean, like you know, th this is the thing. It, it's like you know, you read some of the forums again, early two thousands when there was still this huge debate. You think analog tape, you know, was an, was alchemy of some sort. It just automatically turns your audio into gold, which is absolute bullshit. I think I, I, I came up on analog in the day in college. We had like a, we had a uh, two inch studer in the, in the studio. And the one thing I remember, but it was broken half the time. Yeah. I got you know, all could, the Couldn't do anything. It, it, it's not working. It needs to be repaired. It's like, what fucking good is this? Right. Let that do. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, you, Ethan mentioned SoundForge. <clears throat> I want okay. you guys to think about this, that um, by the time that original product died and Sonic Foundry no, no longer owned it, mm -hmm. there are engineers today who were born after that time. Yes. That's how old digital uh, computer audio is. Well, you know, I was going to say, I mean, like, it, it seems to have really started to round out and become a bit more mature right around, say, the 2010 to two, 2014 era. You know, things really started to, to gel and whatnot, and that's when we started getting, you know, better amp sims and better software. And, um, you know, I mean, like, you can mix completely in the box these days and, and not miss anything. I mean, like, there's some really amazing stuff out there on the end of software. I'll, I'll toot the horn there for... for um, for AIX there for a second. I mean, like, you know, we're doing, I'm doing some stuff, some heavy duty drum stuff right now. And yeah, first thing I'm reaching for on the toms is the, is the AIX drum EQ. Yeah. No, good cool. luck getting one with that with an SSL. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Ethan was talking about, uh, his generation test. Do you remember, uh, rest his soul, but shill in chief, uh, Roger Nichols back when the oh, D88 came Roger out. Roger actually gave me a couple of good tips. I, I, oh, I'm good. not going to throw him under the bus. No, no. And, and he was great at a lot of stuff, but if, if you, it always seemed like he was in front of whatever ad was, was out there, but he took a, a early D88 and he put this, he put this test up. I don't know if Ethan, you remember this, but he, he recorded like a bajillion generations down and it still was pretty damn good when he measured it. And then later on, Ethan did the, the sound, the Studer versus the, uh, or the, he just showed the sound blaster and said that this is uh, better fidelity than two inch tape. And I remember, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. made a picture of him. There was all these caricatures of, uh, there's like all these drawings of Ethan, like the, 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 the cry baby idiot or whatever, you know, it's just crazy stuff. And I'm like, you, you guys, that's all you got to say is, 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 is to make fun of him. How about just refuting his, his uh, evidence there? Oh you no, know? that would take effort. No, no, no. Oh, Get, let's not, ha not have any of that. Dude. We need to burn the witch. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. He, he took it, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way I word it is, in every way you could possibly assess fidelity, even 16-bit, you know, 44 kilohertz beats analog tape hands down in every way. Mm. Flatness of frequency response, distortion, noise, uh, wow and flutter. There's no wow and flutter, there's jitter. But jitter is noise. That's like 120 dB down, mm. 110 dB down. Uh, so it's not, it, it doesn't affect anything. It's not audible. It's a non-issue. But right, well, these people, all they have is insults. Mm. They don't have any... 
the thing is they don't have the technical knowledge. They know I'm wrong. They know in their hearts that I'm wrong, but they can't elucidate why I'm wrong. They can't say what's right. So that's all that's left is insults. That, that well, was yeah, a really big like, part of mine too. I did, I did the, uh, I did the tube shoot out there uh, last year, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's like nine times out of ten on the show, the first thing somebody's gonna say is, "Well, that's fine for heavy distorted stuff, but what about clean?" So we did like three different amps. We used like a little one, one tube amp. We used, you know, uh, what do we use? We used my fifty one fifty. We also did a dual rectifier. We swapped out the power tubes. And um, then we, you know, just for shits and giggles, I'm like, oh, you want clean? Great. Here's here's a 1959 Fender Pro. Let's change the tubes out on that. Let's see what happens. And yeah, the only thing people had to refute it was, well, you didn't watch this other guy's test where, oh, okay, we went and checked out the test. You know, different performances, different this, different that. Everything's different. One right. kid, you know, went as far as to say, oh, I changed my tubes out. Look at my video I made. The, the sound is so much different. I'm like, you changed the speaker cabinet, you moron. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> It's like, it's like the speaker. That's where the sound is in guitar. It's it's not so much the amps. It's the transducer. It's what's turning the signal back into into audio. Sorry, get a little get a little elevated about this stuff because I spent oh, yeah. a lot of time micing caps. But point being is, if you don't run the same signal through, you're never going to get an accurate judgment. If you don't do a level comparison, you're not going to get an accurate right. judgment. Some guy just messaged me the other day. He's like, "Well, I just made a video where I swapped out the tubes. He's playing completely different." And there are different levels. I'm like, great. You just proved the Fletcher Munson effect. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. It, yeah, reamping is great for that. And I've done reamping because, you know, a source is what it is. And, uh, uh, yeah, source is what it is. So, if it, you know, yes, it's not the, miking a speaker playing back a cymbal is not the same as miking a cymbal, but it's still a source and it has a fre- specific frequency content. Right. So there's no reason that you can't use that as a source. And then at least you can leave the mic in the same place. You can level match before or after, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and then you can do a proper comparison. That's why I'm saying it's so difficult to do this stuff properly. People have no idea mm-hmm. how difficult it is. You know, they get up, they change their speaker wires, you know, in the hi-fi world. And, and it's, <laughs> it really bothered me because this used to be hi-fi only uh, audio files, you know, 20, 30 years ago with speaker wire and stuff. Oh, it's guitar back, players. Back then it's in guitar the 60s, and, well, in the 60s when I started doing this stuff, I'm 73 now, uh, it, to be a recording engineer, you actually had to be like an engineer. You had to know how to swap out, you know, circuit boards and and align tape decks and and, and the good ones, you know, could solder new components, do board level repair. Now all you need is an office computer, a four hundred dollar office, you know, Windows computer or a Mac, and you know, a sound card and and a hundred dollar, you know, Audio Technica twenty twenty microphone, and now you're a recording professional. And, you know, they don't have the knowledge in the background. That's, that's why I have a lot of respect for people like George Mastenberg, because mm-hmm. uh, he actually understands how this stuff works, not just how to get good sounds. Fair enough. Yeah. A lot, oops, yeah. A lot of times when we're measuring things, um, I have to, even if we find differences, like you were saying, I, I have a thing that we call the uh, the threshold of give a crapitude, where if you, <laughs> is it actually going to, first of all, is it even audible? Um and if it's not, you know, yes, these converters do measure difference. If you look at my tests, you'll see that there's like a 0.1 dB difference on at 10 hertz on one of these converters or something. But I don't think you care. And uh, Ethan, you talk about this a lot, and I'm still not a thousand percent clear on this. But when I do find these differences and people start throwing out the god of the gaps, even though we can't hear it, um, they will bring up stacking. So what what can you tell us about the stacking? Is stacking a myth or what? Yeah, stacking stacking is nonsense, uh, and that's something else I prove in my audio expert book, and I show logically uh, why it doesn't uh, why it doesn't have have an effect. What is uh, what is you, stacking for yeah, those yeah, of us we... who don't know what that is? <laughs> well, it's it's the theory that if you have a crappy converter, mm. this is the way they would talk about it on the on and at the womb forum or in gear sluts. But if you have a crappy converter and you record. One track, well, that's okay. Oh yeah, but okay, you, I know where you're going. But this, when yeah. you record six six tracks and you mix it all t- and mix them together, the effects accumulate uh, the, the the crappiness mm. and craptitude of 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 the things. But that's not true. If you go through things in series, mm. if you go through a preamp and then turn the volume down back to mic level and then go you know, with a pad or whatever and go to another preamp, you go through six preamps. Well, that's in series, and yes, the distortions will add. They probably won't add as much as what you would think because they're not coherent. Uh, it's a 6 dB versus 3 dB difference. Okay. But but in parallel, they don't add. Uh, I mean, it's just 
separate things, and especially if they're different performances, there's no conflict. Each thing comes through. The problem is it's always the masking effect. When you have a, and this is the, cl- the classic thing, that, well, the bass sounds really clear but uh, when it's soloed, but when it's in the mix, it's all muddy. That's what proves that stacking is wrong. No, that proves that the masking effect is your guitar is, is too chunky, has too much low end. Your piano player is pounding out you know, rhythm part all below middle C, and that's too bassy. If you listen like the r- early Elton John stuff, the piano is really thin, I mean painfully thin, because otherwise it would conflict with the bass, and you wouldn't be able to make out the bass notes. It would just be a bunch of must. So that's where the stacking effect is, is in your ears, with, uh, in your brain, with the masking effect. Interesting. Cool stuff. All right, guys. Well, hey, you know, we're jumping up and we're heading up on a half hour here. So um, do we got anything else we're going to hit on real quick? Um, don't want don't to bore everything. This has been fascinating, though. I definitely want to do this again. This is cool. Um, we'll, we'll get into, pre- I want to, I want to definitely get into the preempt debate in a little bit, but I was just going to say, you know, bottom line. So if you're sitting at home and you're running a little focus, right, Scarlet, you know, a two I two or, 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 you know, whatnot, don't worry about the converters. You're absolutely fine. Yeah. You know, this yeah. Is the thing. Or, or, the, or the preamp, the, yeah. the preamps in these things, I have the, not the third generation, but I have the second generation Scarlet. Mm. And that's what I used. Uh, one, another article I did was measuring capacitor distortion. Cause okay. that's a thing also is. Well, you know, capacitors, you have to pick the right ones, and that's true. Okay. Uh, some capacitors have more distortion than others. So I bought, like, 30 different capacitors, all these different values of ceramic and, and polystyrene and mica, all these different kinds, and measured the distortion of every one using Room EQ Wizard. And I did it through my, you know, by with my Scarlet, which, and, I, of course, I had to measure the distortion of that. And it's, like, way, way down. I, they spec it at .0004. <laughs> I think that's at one color. It's it's a little different at the high end. It gets a little worse, hmm. but but you know, I mean, it's 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 an audible. Let me let me stop you right here about the preamps, and I'm going to tell you something. Do we have one minute? Sure. Well, we've got time. Yeah, because uh, I post this a link to this article on Sound on Sounds website. Sound on Sound is one of the one of the good magazines. They're starting lately. They've been yeah, kind of I was going to say it, they're starting to get a little the wooey. Crap. But mostly they are are science based. They did a huge preamp conversion, and they did it properly uh, using the same source, using reamping. I think they used one of those Yamaha MIDI pianos, I forget. But they compared like 30 different preamps from, you know, the preamp that comes for free in a $50 Behringer mixer to the most expensive stuff. And in the end, nobody could tell the difference between any of them. Now, this is when they were recording clean. When you overdrive them, yes, they distort different. And if you like to record with a preamp, use it as a fuzz tone. Okay, yes, they sound different, but for recording clean, which is what I prefer, I'd rather add distortion in con- and I can hear it all in context when I'm mixing with mm-hmm. plugins. But if you're recording clean, you just want clean, they all sounded the same. Nobody could tell any difference from these 30 preamps. So there's your answer. Yeah, the outrage and 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 excuses and special pleading that when that article the, and the other one where they ended up picking the art and the Mackie, um, it was just the, the amount of you know, it's, it's Glenn's uh, butter of the week. Thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, Buttered it was, it was but that was for yeah, that was for years, man. That was going on. Yeah, yeah that was oh, that yeah. was absolutely nuts. Yeah, it's how dare you criticize the thing I spent money on? That's basically what it yeah. comes down to. Hey, what yeah, I found is right. if if you're operating these things in their linear range, um, they, most of the mic preamps are pretty much the same. And and when people talk about character. They might be talking about distortion, but I don't see them distorting this stuff. It, it's yeah. it was and. I remember before everybody started carrying around these lunch boxes and stuff. I, you know, I used to talk to we talked to Jensen back in the day, and and even Rupert Neve. And, and back then, if you talked to them and you suggested, "Hey, I put something through your mic preamp and it came out different," they'd be upset. But now they're acting like uh, that's 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 the goal, you know. But back in the day, engineers were trying to get clean. I mean, they had a lot of problems they had to deal with, and and they're trying to get the cleanest signal through as possible. You know, right. Ethan's, yeah. Ethan's well, four parameters or whatever. Well, I, I got to right. say, you know, I remember, you know, 2000, I went out and bought my first high end preamp. You know, I got a Vintech Dual 72, you know, and, you know, wheeled it in, mic'd up my amp, and I'm like, where's my glorious metal tone? Nah. And I didn't get it. I'm like, well, hang on a second here. What's going on? I, I read on the forums, I need better preamps. I need better converters. I need this. It's all bullshit. You know, a lot of preamps today, new preamps use a 5532 op amp. Okay. This, this chip is like 30 years old. <laughs> but it's really good. 
And uh, it, I mean, it's really good. So, and, and it has more distortion. I mean, 001 instead of 0001 or whatever, you know, than, sure. than really state-of-the-art stuff. But again, nobody can hear the difference. I just bought a uh, an 8-in and out USB sound card so I could do surround mixing in my home theater. And they were, and they said it, we use 5532 op amps for the preamps. And, and the specs were, you know, very good. Mm. My point is it's not hard to make a high-quality preamp these days uh, in the last, you know, couple, you know, decades. Right. <laughs> you know. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. So if you're, yeah, if you're using affordable gear, you know what? And it sounds good. Yeah, it is good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, I think that's the point there. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up there. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Like, we'll, I'd like to pick this up in a few weeks, maybe do something again next month. We'll talk a, yeah. a little bit sure. more about things, but, uh, very much appreciate it. So once again, that's Ethan Weiner and, uh, who's no, he's got to, got to remember he's no longer with real traps. He's retired now, but you've still got a book, well, actually, right? Actually, I, no, I, I am. I'm, okay. I'm, uh, the, the toll free number comes to my house. The email comes to my house. Okay. I don't own the business anymore. One of our former employees owns it. So I, I work for him now, but no, I'm still involved. I'm still, okay, when cool. people get room treatment advice, it comes from me. Fantastic. Okay. So if you need some room treatment, give Ethan a call. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, and of course we've got Pipeline Audio who's, uh, who's working away on some really cool stuff from AIX that I'm getting to check out uh, while I'm down in California in the next week or two. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully we didn't bore you to death too much. Hopefully uh, you guys l maybe learned something. I'm going to go check out that, that measurement plugin because I really want to take a look at that. Oh, yeah. That's, it's it's that's killer. Cool. Also, Plugin Doctor, if you really want to um, really learn a lot about stuff, Plugin right. Doctor is pretty good. All right. I will check that out. All right. Once again, thank you so much, guys. And uh, thanks, for everybody, for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And we'll be back again next month with another roundtable. Take care. Hey. All right. Thank you.